I'm the policy and engagement analyst at the United Nations Development Program. Welcome to the second webinar in our series, Supporting SMEs, Protecting Livelihoods, co-organized by the UN in Sri Lanka, the United Nations Development Program, and the UN Global Compact Network in Sri Lanka, with Stax and Layer 7 Seguro Consultoria partnering for today's webinar as our knowledge partners. Today's webinar will focus on how SMEs can thrive in the age of digital transformation while protecting from cyber threats. Our previous webinar was on reimagining business operations in the customer-centric new normal. This was, of course, a natural uh, thematic succession to our first webinar, which was titled Data to Understand Dynamic Global Situations and Repositioning Businesses. In this backdrop, I would like to welcome our panelists for today, Dushan Kahandagamage and Mano Sena Ratna from Stax and Sujit Christie from Layer 7 Seguro Consultoria. Following the presentations made by Dushan, Christy, and Mano, there will be a Q&A session, which will be moderated by Azam Bakir Makar, who is the Partnerships and Development Finance Specialist at the UN Resident Coordinator's Office in Sri Lanka. I would also like to take this opportunity to invite all participants to put their questions on the Q&A box. We would like to see you engage and to take part, and we look forward to a thought-provoking session. Without further ado, I would, I would now like to invite uh, Dushan Kahandagamage to uh, commence proceedings with his presentation. Dushan, over to you. Thank you, Riza. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to join the discussion. I uh, hope, ho hope this session will allow you to gain a good insights, a lot of good insights that can be used to really uh, plan out your next digital adoption journey. Um, so I think as uh, Risa mentioned today, we are gonna discuss how SMEs can uh, actually should thrive in the age of digital transformation while uh, protecting against like uh, cyber attacks. So uh, for me to start, I think uh, the prevailing pandemic actually taught us a lot of uh, citizens personally and also led many businesses to rethink about their uh, in, uh, the models, business models, and uh, activate their business continuity planning in a hurry, and also to come up with some emergent and creative strategies. So even post-pandemic, we know, uh, and we are now hearing a second wave, but even post-pandemic, we know the business continuity, right? Uh, supply chain management, employee engagement, um, working capital management are going to be high priority areas for, for SMEs. Mostly for SMEs, going to be a big, big uh, focus area. So people didn't really think about business continuity plans, right? So he never thought, you know, no one never, I mean, no one really thought that, you know, a business country plan will be very essential because we haven't witnessed something like that, something like this global outbreak. But it became an essential thing over time and, and the necessity was amplified because of COVID, right? So if you think about digital uh, in the current age, the story isn't uh, different. We are, the companies are just, uh, I would say, riding the technology transformation, just going with the flow and not following a structured process for digital adoption. So digital transformation was once a very smart thing. I would say a smart strategy, a buzzword, but now it's simply a, a, a survival, not even a necessity, it's simply a question of survival. So in the future, I think we all think business won't be able to survive or won't be able to compete in grand scheme if they don't adopt digital principles, tools, and techniques like that. So this is, I think we all feel, you know, this is the absolute right time for all of us to think about having a solid digital strategy in place because we know the digital can increase the speed, agility, and the overall performance of your organization. So today we are not gonna really talk about, you know, all the, uh, talk about what digital is and the, what the benefits and also how it plays a role in the SME industry because those topics are pretty matured, widely discussed, known topics. So instead we are gonna talk about, you know, biggest question, you know, when it's come to digital adoption or the transformation, a, a simple strategy that you can follow as SME or maybe even large cause of it. So basically, but to set the context for us, you know, how I see how uh, we at Staxi is digital as an enabler. In other ways, in other words, like, you know, digital is a means by which the customer value is delivered. So moving on. So if you see this slide, 
uh, I mean, as I said, pandemic or no pandemic, we all know business landscape, landscape is rapidly changing. How is changing? Yes, because of evolving customer needs, but it's driven by a technology. So if you see this slide, I mean, there are lots of concepts, you know, technology solutions, which are the true driving forces of digital adoption. So if you, I mean, these are definitely changing the business landscape and also the technology landscape. So you already have seen these things and maybe already using some of these technologies, but one must not, one must not get excited or be threatened or, or scared about these things and rush yourself to something ineffective. Because if you see the each of these technologies should be adopted via a structured process after careful consideration. So, so message is guys, you know, there are many more technologies to come over the next five to 10 years. So it's all about how you pick your battle and make informed decisions. The other thing, uh, if you see these, these technologies or solutions are interchangeably used for concepts like you know, transformation, adoption, the strategy, implementation. If you see, you know, it was one of my personal struggles when I was also you know, trying to learn in this, you know, master in this industry, maybe five, six years ago, there's a lot of information. You know, a lot of articles, you know, thought leadership pieces, uh, videos, sessions, but, you know, sometimes, you know, content is good, but it's often contradict each other and confuses you a, a, a lot. So we thought of, you know, you know, uh, uh, thought of like explaining the differences, you know, because it's important to understand the differences before we get to the framework. So let me quickly take you through this. You know, if you see the, how we see all these uh, I would say concepts are part of the digital journey, what we call a digital journey. If a company is willing to have a, a journey, a digital journey, this is how it would pan out. You know, you have to have a strategy, you have to start with the digital strategy, then the implementation. And when you start enjoying the benefits of the results and you start using the technology, you call it digital adoption. And then you can actually think about digital transformation. What we have seen, some people without even having a strategy are talking about digital transformation. Because a person who, may, who, who uh, wrote an article, maybe a company who brought in a, a cutting edge ERP is now talking about a transformation in newspapers. So, but what we have seen, you know, is often fail because, you know, you don't have the foundation. So it's important that you understand this, you know, it's a, it's a journey. So these are more or less, it's a, like a piece of a puzzle. So, you know, you can't operate because every, element has its own nuances in terms of what it entails and, and how it should be executed. So strategy is like a roadmap and timelines, where do you want? Implementation is governance, which is the monitoring, controlling, and also commitment, resource commitment. Adoption is, you know, you adopt technologies after your roadmap, you know, after you implement to grow top line and maybe prove in bottom line, uplift, uplift productivity. So the transformation is completely something very different where you will have a digital enterprise with the transform business models and processes. So this is how we see all of these concepts uh, should link each other and, and actually should play a role in the digital journey. Um, so just to, uh, I mean, if I actually uh, the, uh, talk about the framework, so now we talk about the, the uh, uh, approach, a process of framework, you know, so, as I said my, in my last slide, there are no shortcuts, okay? So following a process is a very important thing. I think we have emphasized with our clients and with the work people we work with, it's very important. I mean, it don't, don't think it as simple thing. It's important to have a process in place. So, but the biggest question we have heard is, okay, how you do this? The next question, the immediate question is, okay, how you do it? So that's why, I mean, today we thought of, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, introducing a simple frame framework because digital transformation or strategy, it's important to follow a framework, right? That, that, uh, that uh, a fact I need to establish. According to even reports published by a lot of consult big consultancy firms that, you know, most of the time, 30 to 40, even 50% of digital strategies fail, not because anything, not following a structured approach during the both designing and implementation stages. So unlike large companies, if you take especially SMEs, you guys are very, you know, usually, you know, by nature, they have very limited resources, which then demands for effective utilization of them. So 
Therefore, we want to introduce a very uh, simple but a comprehensive framework that SMEs can use to plan their digital adoption or even transformation. Because it's never too late. It's a long term when we understand that, but it's never too late. With the current situation, I think we never know. We don't know. I mean, the transformation will be required in, in, in the next two, three years as a SME also. So this is a framework we use with our clients irrespective of size of the industry they belong to. But what we have done today, we have customized that a little bit, uh, slightly modified to suit the structure of an SME. Uh, in summary, I mean, there are eight components to this framework, but we are not going to talk about, or I'm not going to show the full diagram right now to, to, to ensure that we have the focus and also to improve the comprehension. It might be too much for us, to, for anyone to digest. But later in the presentation, when we wrap things up, we are going to talk about that. So let me for quickly focus on the on the first section, which is the the four the four, first four C's. I would say this section is is uh, is like the almost like the core. I would say the, the first the foundation. The so before I actually get into it, I need to emphasize this again. You know, this is something we preach again. You know. We need to have a detailed involvement in space. It's not going to be something that you can do overnight. You know, you can't do it on the go. So this is going to be your strong foundation, as I said. So it's a very time consuming one, not going to take like two, three months, but you know, it's time consuming. So you can follow many approaches. You know, you can sit with your employees. You can, you know, as a leadership team, you can do brainstorming sessions. Maybe you can hire an individual expert or a consultant. Maybe you can go for a consultancy firm, but long story short, guys, you know, make sure that a solid time is spent on this exercise, you know, this first part, because if you see more or less it's like a micro analysis. So first C is a clarity is understanding yourself. The second C is I will get into details, but in the interest of time, we not, will not be explaining detail. But if you have any questions, need clarification, please let's use the Q&A session. We can help you understand some of these things, uh, some of these uh, areas a little bit deep. Uh, so customers, then the capability is your resource strength. And then the competition is, of course, the, the market dynamics. So if I have to talk about the, the knowing yourself, you know, the, the clarity the about yourself, it's a diagnosis of the situation. You know, you're running this business for a while, maybe. So it's first you start with, you know, taking your stock of what has happened, you know, diagnosis of your performance. So the strategic ambition, you know, it could be in the form of mission, vision, you know, your B hack, anything, but it's important. We are not gonna say, you know, you know, vision, mission, all of this jazz, but it's important to have this strategic ambition, you know, as a company where, why do you exist? What do you want to do? So this strategic ambition, as an example, you know, you probably want to be the most digitally enables customer centric uh, organization. Like that, you need to have the ambition. And then of course, under your clarity, under clarity section, understanding your value proposition. You know, you sell a product, right? You deliver value. So and you need to understand what is the value that you bring onto the table in the eyes of the customer. So it's important to understand not just a product, you're selling value to the customer at the end of the day. So understanding that value proposition. So this is a, a great exercise. I mean, it's an important thing if you're especially selling a generic product. So you need to think about really plan out your uh, value proposition. Then you move to the, uh, you know, competition, which is the marketplace. You know, so many questions to think about. In short, yes, it's about competition and the market. So what are the, what are the alternatives that are available from, for, for customers from your competitors, right? You know, what are the strengths of your competitor? You know, how have they priced it? You know, how, who are their suppliers? How, how they manage the supply chain? You know, what do we have as a company uh, to really contest with them? I mean, you need to have something to contain. Otherwise, this competition word is irrelevant because if you don't have anything to compete, which is mean you're not competing, you're just letting it go. So as an example, you know, what customers are looking uh, on the web about you? What do they research about you? So it's important to understand how you stand against your competitors and, and, and basically uh, what do you have? What do you have to compete with them? Then we move on to the important part, which is the customer. You know, as you know, the customer is almost the king. So you have to really uh, uh, ponder about this. So again, very simple, you know, what are the customer designs? How many are there? You know, how those customer needs are evolving? You know, um, how we solve a specific demand if that is not addressed in the past 
as an example your delivery order you know if you want to deliver something in two days if that is not addressed you're not going to win this battle so understanding customer and their behaviors evolving behaviors and their demands it's very important so that is number three so four is resource it's time talent cash you know human physical financial technology infrastructure and what do you have your strength because you can't be doing everything because it depends on your resource you have so this will i mean to some to quickly go to the next slide too this will help you do a, a quick micro analysis which leads the way to identify your performance as a as a company and the gaps weaknesses growth aspiration and your threats so difference that i want to highlight specifically for smes identifying the sweet spot you know for a big company you can do these uh, areas uh, uh, like in isolation but for you it's important that you identify the sweet spot uh, the 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 winning spot because as a SME, you are limited with maybe resources, okay? So basically what we want to understand as a SME specifically is, is our business inspirational or unique enough in the marketplace compared to competition, you know, that can attract enough customers by fulfilling their involving needs and also can be, can achieve this mission with our, the resources you have at your hand. So, so one good thing is this framework will after you do all four quarters, you probably go to the strategic ambition and we'll change it because you feel, you know, with all of these things, when you find a sweet spot, this ambition is not going to be feasible in the next five, 10 years. So you probably go, we have seen it. So don't shy away, go back and change it. So the, the last part of this engine is the change where we talk about two engines. One is the, the growth engine and the other one is the transformation engine, because this is what you say is anticipating the level of change required to achieve our strategic ambitions. It's basically finalizing our growth aspiration in line with our strategic ambitions. So growth engine outlines, where are you now? Where do you want to play? Basically your direction for digital adoption. So transformation engine is defining the avenue in which the transformation should take place. So summarize to summarize like five C's we have already explained, clarity, customer, competition, capability, and the change, which are your growth engines. Now uh, let's take a look at uh, the other options. Again, uh, talking about uh, an SME and also how they can uh, look during uh, look at the change step during uh, crisis. That is uh, again looking at growth and transformation at the same time. So selecting which part you want to take. Uh, will actually depend on your appetite and specifically your business strategy. There is nothing wrong in selecting one or the other during a crisis, but the implementation of a transformation exercise is going to be difficult for most SMEs. So uh, what is the most important, what is most, most important is to have your business strategy formulated properly without aligning your business strategy with the digital strategy, we're actually aiming uh, for failure. Now, uh, let's look at the most important aspect of your business strategy. Any ideas? So, uh, actually, as most of you would have guessed, it's your customer. And the customer is the person who is responsible for bringing you the top line. On the vertical axis in this diagram, you can see that we have indicated the relationship that the customer has with your brand or business. The horizontal axis indicates the size of your customer base. Ideally, you would want to earn the mass market with high customer int intimacy. However, this is not easy for most SMEs. And also depending on your strategy, you may select to be the, on the prime quadrant or on the authority quadrant. The attention quadrant is also good, but it will be more suitable for specific industries like F FMCG, for example. So this quadrant requires you to be on top of the digital marketing game and to consistently pump in cash so that you keep your brand and the, and the business on uh, top of mind for the customer. And the box in the middle basically indicates your options for digital adoption. The options given in this example is for digital marketing. So that, that is just for this presentation, but then you can also look at 
supply chain, for example, or even internal operations. So depending on where you want to pay and based on your business strategy and your digital adoptions focus, you can select the different elements or the different actions that you would like to take based on where you want to go. And when it comes to transformation, it's all about being digital. It's a long-term strategy and not all SMEs are expected to go here in the short term, specifically during a crisis. That doesn't mean that you should not consider the options. Generally, SMEs have limited resources. And as a result, you eventually end up in a corner as shown in the diagram. And that is where you need to be careful not to fall into a lane. If you focus more on pleasing the customer, you will have a highly satisfied customer but your internal operations will be crippled, not being able to deliver what your customer needs and also eventually this hype will go away. So a good example is uh, during the COVID crisis when the country was on lockdown, most players in the retail business failed to reach their customer. Most players had their e-commerce website set up and most customers were already using their services without a hassle. But when the country went on lockdown, there was a sudden surge in demand and their servers could not handle the load. Inventories were not planned to handle the sudden spike and they were out of stock. And only when you have smaller stocks that you will realize that the importance of managing stock. For example, uh, what would you have to, what, basically what would you tell your customer who has placed an order through your website which was not linked to your inventory and you didn't have enough stock? Delivery options, were also not organized to handle the demand. And they had to put people into a virtual queue. And I know for a fact, like, you know, even for myself, we had to wake up in the morning and then refresh, uh, like, you know, refresh the web page so many times to get on the queue, right? So is this pos positive uh, experience? Absolutely not. And similarly, if you focus more on the internal operations and neglect the customer, you will have to invest more on winning the customer back basically the customers that you lost to competitors who have been doing their digital marketing well. So uh, look at pharma companies, for example. They had everything going well be before the crisis. Their operations were perfect and supply chains were doing well. However, during the crisis, none of the pharma companies ran a successful delivery operation for medicines, and this is an essential. So they, keep, they quickly tried to resort to WhatsApp, Viber, and SMS, basically not realizing that these tech platforms were never planned for e-commerce. So if they had planned for digital customer experience early on, they would have had the whole pharma industry disrupted by now. Some pharma companies kept calling me uh, about orders that I had placed about a week ago, just to tell me that they will deliver it in another week's time. So the whole point is gone. So what we are saying is that generally you need to focus on the external factors as well as internal factors. But as an SME, it is always safer to stay in the middle. And the problem now is when is that time to kick off the engine, basically to focus. So with, uh, uh, we know that uh, there is no specific right time and also with digital, things change fast. And that doesn't mean that you have to adopt everything at once. As you can see in the diagram also, it is easy to fall into one of the blue paths that is to be excelled in either customer experience or operations. Ideally, you should find a good balance between equal focus of your customer as well as internal operations. If you get stuck in one area, it will be hard to come back because our investment to move from uh, one area to the other or to basically move diagonally is going to be high. And then even though during the short term, we suggest that you need to focus on both the digital customer experience as well as the operations side, over time you will realize that you are eventually moving on to a more digital business with an evolved digital model. And this is an illustration of the business maturity curve along with the digital adoption. So, 
as the visibility of the business model, uh, the viability of the uh, business model decreases, you will need to have adopted technology to, to a level where your whole business model starts to evolve. Over time, you will see a completely new business model that is fully digitally enabled. And this time period can be anywhere between three years from now to even 10 years from now. But what is important is to be on the survival path. And going there is not an immediate thing and it's not easy. So again, as uh, Dushan mentioned, there are so many technologies that promise a lot of things and adopting those just for the sake of going digital or because your customer is adopting, your computer is adopting, uh, it will not take you anywhere. Any uh, investment on uh, digital should actually be carefully considered and made at the appropriate time in the appropriate level. It is uh, not mandatory that you change your business model at this and, and because this will gradually happen over time with technology changes and also with ex external factors changing, just that you need to be aware that the changes are happening in the environment and also be ready to kick off when it's time. And during crisis, uh, there's a lot of pressure for SMEs from a digital perspective. So your computers will be adopting new technology and you will feel that you too should go with the flow. But actually as an SME with uh, restricted resources, you need to take a step back and think, will this be just another phase? Because survival is more important than fighting the current during a flood. And in the previous slide, we saw that the new business models may emerge as a result of technology adoption during a crisis. However, it, uh, it also brings a risk of failure. If you don't want to take a chance, actually try to understand these three elements that's shown in this slide. So what, number one is, is the business continue, the business's continuity at stake? Basically, is there uncertainty about the outcomes of the business? And then the second thing is to look at whether the external pressure from the technological advancements in the environment is high or low. That is uh, basically, uh, do you feel that uh, the more and more, uh, that more and more of your competitors are adopting technology and more of your customers are demanding these features? If you feel that is happening, then that means that the pressure on your business to adopt these technologies are high. And also the third and the most important thing is to understand whether this technology is going to be disruptive. Meaning, will this replace the current status quo? Or is it just another fad that will be short-lived? So basically, once you understand those three, you can look at this quadrant and understand what you need to do. So basically, if the uncertainty in your business is low, that is, you, you basically know what's going to happen next. And also, if there is less pressure from the technology side, basically keep your systems, keep your platforms, uh, glide through the waters. And then if, if you feel like uh, there is more pressure coming from outside, but you still know what's, what's happening, if, if uncertainty is low, basically look at adopting other changes, like you know, improving your existing systems to maybe like, you know, get an in-house developer to do some additional changes that you require, maybe change your processes and try to improve on those things rather than going to uh, go, go for a full digital adoption. Then, if the pressure is low, but still, if there is uncertainty, always look to explore options out there because definitely there might be a better way of doing things than what you are doing currently. And then, if uh, both on, on, on both ends, if things are high, basically, if you are, if uh, the uncertainty is high, and also if the technological advancements in the environment is also high, basically you are pressurized. So then again, don't directly go and adopt, but then evaluate look at other options there might be other uh, uh, packages other other platforms other technologies that's available at the same uh, period at, at, during the same time right so you can evaluate certain options so if for example if you are going for an erp adoption there might be different vendors there might be different options there might be open source solutions there might be what versions that are much more tweaked and customized to your industry so look at those options evaluate and then go for it and at the same time, while doing all of this, you need to realize and also understand and try to figure out whether these technologies 
going to have a future potential that will actually disrupt the way you are doing business. If this disruption potential is high, then you don't have a lot of time. You just need to quickly go and adapt. Before adapting, you need to evaluate and see whether it's investment worthwhile and whether where it's going to take your business based on your business objectives, like I mentioned before, based on your business strategy. If that makes sense, go ahead and adopt that technology. And if you don't know the answer for the, to the th third question, for example, then you look at question one and two and try to identify your position in the typology and then uh, make your decision based on that. So we are moving to the uh, moving to the rest of the framework. Actually, we discussed five C's. Um, so basically, clarity, customer, competition, and uh, change and capabilities. So the remaining three C's. I said eight out of eight. So create, the commit, and the control. So if you see now, you when you know the roadmap where do you want to go in terms of digital adoption, where you really uh, uh, finalize your uh, the go way forward, you need to now create a detailed implementation plan. You know, that plan should have specific timelines. This is a very important thing. You know, be it a very complicated one, have a specific timelines. But more than that, you need to think about your project prioritization. We have seen, you know, doing this micro and the macro analysis, you'll end up having lots of a bunch of good ideas and tech projects or tech initiatives. So, but what we do, the first thing that we do is, you know, prioritizing. So we have put together a small framework that you can use for prioritization, which is very easily, you can think about, you know, complexity and the investment. So I think for SME, we highly recommend that you avoid that, you know, the projects that are highly complicated and investment, investment high ones, because that is more towards the transformation. If you are looking at transformation, yes, you can uh, start fancying about these things, but in uh, in normal conditions, I would say with the uncertainty environment like this for SMEs, uh, like you know you have to think about the ideal ones. You know complexity is low, investment is low. It could be a modification to your existing system. You know to uh, add more couple of features, or maybe you connect with another uh, system to an API. So make sure that you do this prioritization. You know, uh, you know one again complexity high, investment is low, it's good, but you have to have a very cautious approach because with your capabilities and resources, we have seen often uh, people fail because it's a complex one. So it's, it's, it's up to your appetite and your resources where you need to prioritize. So think about your the last one, the, the last the capabilities, cash, talent, and also the time. Based on that, you can actually do the prioritization. Then you go into the actual implementation. Committing yourself is very important. You know, you can't, you know, as a leader, you can't let your, you know, the lower middle executives to run this show. You have to be involved. So leadership support is absolutely important. You know, if you don't have time, you know, let's say at least four hours, five hours per week, or maybe if it is not there, this is this adoption, digital adoption, or these adoption strategies cannot be executed. So it's important that you have the leadership support and the commitment. And the learning culture, you know, because one of the biggest barriers for SMEs is, you know, this culture. You need to inculcate that culture. You need to inculcate a culture where they would accept the digital technologies. You know, they're ready to accept, ready to go in with uh, implementation. So, the the other one is resource synchronization. You know, if you I know you guys are you know cash maybe cash uh, uh, in terms of you know cash, it's your cash, low in cash, low in resources. So make sure that you have the right resource uh, uh, put in place to ensure that implementation. Then the final one is the control. Again, absolutely important part because, you know, where you actually have KPIs in place to ensure that you control the, implement the, 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 control the implementation and also control post implementation. So having implementation and post implementation KPIs is absolutely important. And very important again, avoiding delays. If you make it a habit, we have seen, and I'm sure you might have seen, Having delays over delays, you know, actually it, it, it destroys the entire program. You know, it reduces the excitement. You know, it, so you need to make sure you keep the ball rolling, keep the excitement going. So make sure that you avoid delays at any cost. 
and then the security you know once you have these systems in place then comes uh, the biggest question is security which will be covered by again in the next session by suji so it's very important that you you know uh, uh, think about these three c's also these are long term one again very uh, uh, you have to have make informed decisions throughout all of these steps so uh, to sum up if you see you know these are the eight these are the eight c's you know as i said how it plans out if you see the first five c's are along the strategy and then the last three c's are around the execution very similar to uh, uh, maybe a corporate study you would see you know this adopting digital is is not an easy thing as i said bcp no one thought now it will happen to the digital you turn back and see you have spent 100 million on the technology but you have earned very little you have the yield was very little and maybe it's long term you are taking 10 years to take uh, get to the roi so it's not the same so make sure that you have this structured framework followed if you want to have a, a solid digital adoption uh, uh, practice or the process in place Thank you, thank you, Dushan and Mano, um, uh, for for the presentation on digital adoption. Uh, may I um, invite now Sujit uh, Christy um, to uh, to make your presentation. Dushan or Mano, do you want to unshare your slides so you could get Sujit to share his? So Sujit will touch on cyber security, um, which is uh, an important topic these days. A lot of companies are facing difficulty in navigating uh, the challenges faced by uh, increased uh, threats to their um, you know, IT infrastructure. Sujit, if you're ready, you can unmute yourself and uh, start with the screen on. Yeah, there you go. Sujit, you can start. You can unmute. Sujit, we can't still hear you. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. And sometimes that unmute button becomes the biggest challenge in a webinar, right? Sometimes you've got to go looking for it, <laughs> and when you find it, it doesn't get activated, right? I, I hope all of you are staying safe, good, and uh, I think uh, I have about ten, fifteen minutes to do my presentation. I'll try and keep it brief as much as possible. Uh, my intention is uh, to make you aware, uh, make you aware of the things which are happening in Sri Lanka as well as globally. Uh, intention is not to scare you, right? This is uh, I would like to draw parallels with the COVID outbreak. Uh, and when it when it when the news started breaking out, uh, I'm referring to not uh, March. I'm talking about times like November, December, right? That's the first time I got to know about it. So I was actually asking my clients, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about our supply chains? November, no reaction. December, soon after Christmas, closer to New Year, people started asking, okay, should we really worry about it? The business continuity teams were summoned and we said, okay, let's start tracking what's happening globally. So we started looking at how countries were being impacted. So I'm referring to the times where we saw you know, lockdowns in China, Korea, Italy, Spain. And maybe by middle of February, uh, most of my clients had already started activating their BZP. Uh, what would we do in case if we will go, were to go in for a lockdown? Who will do what? Who will do what from where? So all the logistics, everything was planned. So that's what I think Dushan and team were also trying to refer in terms of talking about business continuity. So sometimes we tend to see things what we can see in front of us, but
but there are things in our business which we can't see. And for example, your supply chain. You know, all of us went through a horrible time trying to get our groceries, our food, food, food stuff ordered, right? Sudden surge, and it was not planned. Even if we had planned, I don't know whether we would have met such a surge, right? It was a huge uh, peak. I know some of the uh, retail uh, supermarkets, I mean, they had about 4,000, 5,000 orders in less than four hours, which doesn't happen on a normal business day, right? So how do we manage? Even Amazon had the same situation. They had orders, that, but they were, there were no people to do the logistics to pack and deliver the things. Goods were available, but there was no last mile delivery option. I'm sure all of us experienced similar challenges, right? Now, why am I talking about this on a presentation when I got to talk about cybersecurity? Now, this is where the attackers, the, the malicious people, people with malicious intent will try to capitalize, right? Now, the, if you see this slide, it says, it is scaring almost all businesses. I don't think the attackers have now spared saying, I will go after Fortune 500. I will probably go at the top 100 companies in Sri Lanka. That's not their intention. Their intention, if they can get through to any one of us, they get through to the company as well. That's, that's their intention. Because overnight, a lot of things changed. Now, if you look at uh, most of the businesses, especially the banking, finance, insurance. These are the companies which focus a lot on cybersecurity because they handle cash, they handle customer information. And very often we do not hear people talk about uh, retail outlets. Uh, we don't hear about manufacturing companies talking about security. Now this unusual situation actually made us pause and ask, us, ask the question, is there anyone who is going to be spared by the hackers? Is there anyone, any company globally who will be spared from this wrath of the attackers? Because they are trying to monetize. Now, this is a survey done by this consulting firm. They had facilitated 143 cases to pay ransom. That is in 2019. What is our situation in Sri Lanka? Let's see. Now, if you look at this slide, the darker the color, the higher the risk. Now you can see Sri Lanka here. It's neither too dark nor less, but this image was taken from the, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum in 2015 and a report. But last year, World Economic Forum also said the attacks are growing in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia. South Asia includes Sri Lanka as well. I, I saw you know, people inviting me to talk to them about cybersecurity, countries like Nepal, Bangladesh. We, we saw an increase in the attacks and the same is true with Sri Lanka as well. Right? Now, the overnight change, which I'm referring to, if you look at the image on the left, the very first image, it, it reflects an office. That's where we normally spend a lot of time. Monday to Friday, half our life is spent in an office like this. The lockdown made every single user evacuate the office and go to their houses. So the house, it's supposed to be a place where you rest and you know, spend time with your family was turned into a you know, mobile office overnight. So when you work in an organization in an office, you're most, mostly working out of a secure environment. This was an opportunity for the attackers because they knew now all the users who were probably working behind the secured wall are now out there. Now, what would they do to get through to them? The easiest thing is to get people to make a mistake. Now, the easiest thing for people to make mistake is when they get an email. Now, all of, us, all of you would have got an email saying that you've been chosen to be the here of a king who had been in South, South Africa. And they got loads of money and they have you know, identified you as the most trusted person to take the money out. Now, you don't even know these people. Or sometimes you, know, you might get a mail saying, you, know, you won a lottery. 
how can you win a lottery which you have never bought? The sad thing, right? The human mind always languishes things which you don't have, right? You, you tend to become greedy. People do tend to become greedy. So when things like this flash up on their screen, it's a natural inclination to use that finger and click on it. That's what they call it fishing. Now we saw in Sri Lanka, right? I'm talking from a Sri Lankan context. We saw a lot of fishing attacks since last October. It started going up and up, right? You know, specific organizations were targeted, specific people were targeted in an organization. So they would customize the email, basically collecting information from the social media platforms, the LinkedIn and various other places where they can collect an information, craft an email and send it. So when you read the mail, it's so convincing. It might appear to have come from a customer of yours. Or they might be corresponding with one of your customers, as if you know it is you who has been actually writing to that. And we saw a lot of people losing money because they had remitted based on an email instruction. Either they remitted money out of the Sri Lankan account or the monies which were supposed to be received by them was taken by somebody else because somebody in between got, to, got into the chat and got them to you know, send the monies to another place. So typically, the email becomes the number one threat vector for all of us. So they use email as a platform to get through to the users. So when you click on any link, it installs backdoors, malware, ransomware as well. Now ransomware is something where you lose all your data. In other words, you have your machine, it completely encrypts your data. This is like kidnapping. You've heard of people getting kidnapped, right? I mean, I'm sure your parents, your grandparents would have told you when you were growing up, be careful not to talk to strangers. You know, sometimes, you know, they might catch you, put you into a sack and take you and, you know, use you in a, in a place where you need the child labor or whatever, right? You know, that's, that's what our parents have been always telling us, you know, be careful. Now, today, these guys, more than kidnapping the humans, they kidnap your data. Right? I mean, those of you who follow my articles on the Sunday Times, I have written about ransomware and I talk about how these guys actually use these technologies to kidnap your data and hold you at ransom. So during the last 100 days, there were more than 100 companies in Sri Lanka who were victims of ransomware attacks. I don't know whether any of you were victims of it, but it's a very, very depressing situation to be in because you lose your data, you cannot transact, you can't do business. Now those days people were targeting a laptop or a la desktop to be encrypted. So what do the IT guys do? Format it and get the system back, and, back on track. But this time around, they went after the servers. And some of the companies which got encrypted or were victims of the ransomware attack were in the news as well. But it's a huge loss, not only for the company, but also for the employees, as well as for the economy as a whole. Right? So moving on, right? I want to talk a little bit on the mobile applications. Now, mobile applications are also a, a threat vector. Now, all of us use smartphones. There are several applications out there. How many of you actually go and Google to see which were the applications which were removed from the store? Now, a typically an application when it gets installed or a malware gets installed, the attackers do five things. Initially, they gain access, steal your credentials, meaning your username and password, then see whether they can actually hop from your machine to another machine in the network and continue to be there on the network. And then finally, use the payload to do the attack. Now, here's a list of applications which were removed by the Google store recently, recently as in last week. They've listed about 25 applications. And if you look at it, some of them are relating to flashlights. Some of them are wallpapers. Now, what did these applications do? They get installed and they were stealing your credentials. They say it was stealing credentials from your social media platform but if it can do it from your social media platform, it can also do, it can also steal your credentials from your other applications as well, right? So that's the danger which you have, right? So if those of you are using smartphones, 
homework for you. Go check to see what applications have been removed. Remove those, remove those applications immediately, right? So you need to also have a good antivirus. So COVID also made people go look for COVID related information. Now this, this uh, slide which you have is the data as of this morning. If you see at the left-hand corner at the bottom, it was 12, 5 a.m., right? This is the global statistics. But then there, are, there were more than 20, 30,000 websites were registered during this period. So between March 12th and 18th or March 12th and 16th, there were about 3,000 websites which were registered globally about talking about COVID. And most of them happens to be malicious. So which means somebody would access the website, click on it, it would download a malware. Or it was an application which probably said, you know, here's a tracker, it would download a malware, right? So in, in summary, right, before I bring this session to a close, I just want you to, if you, if you, if you have a camera in, with you or a smartphone with you, you can just take a quick picture of this, easy way of take away something, right? So I want you, want you to focus on these 10 things, right? But I am not going to talk about all these 10 things, but I would like to you know, highlight on a few things which are very, very important. Passwords. Passwords should not be used. The same password should not be used in all the applications. Now, this is like your house key, right? You can't use the same key you use to open the front door to open your car. You have different keys for different doors. Likewise, you need to have separate passwords, username and passwords for different applications. If you can enable multi-factor authentication, you should do that, right? And sometimes you might not be able to remember the password. That's the biggest problem, right? All of us have got used to gadgets. So we used to you know, store our credentials in the contacts. Now the attackers, what would they do? They would try and attack those applications which, which host all these information. For example, Truecaller. So if they get through to Truecaller, they can actually get through to most of the users, username, password, and the details, whatever they have, because it's already stored there. So refrain from doing such things, right? I also want you to focus on the data, right? So one, you need to identify what is your sensitive information, what is critical, ensure that you have a good backup of it. Continuously take backup so that, you know, if something goes wrong, you can always restore it from that. And today you have so much of cloud-based uh, backup storage available, storage available in the cloud, but be very careful to choose what is right. Not everything there out there can be trusted. So you need to be mindful about it. The third one I want to highlight is about the VPN. So every time we go, we have a lockdown. So we have lockdown for COVID. We also had internet lockdown, right? Something happens in the country and then the government decides to curtail the internet access. And what do most Sri Lankans did? They all downloaded a free VPN and there were a lot of VPN providers globally who said, specially away, made available free for Sri Lankans. And almost all these VPN applications were terminating in a malicious server, which means you were connecting to a bad server and that bad server was accessing your information. And all of us thought that we, we were smarter than the government so that we could bypass all the controls put down by SLT and dialogue and you know, access the social media platforms and various other uh, platforms to you know, disseminate or read information. But in, eventually the attackers were gaining access to your information or your data. Right? I spoke about uh, phishing and all organizations should focus on creating a good security policy. You also need to continuously educate your users, the do's and the don'ts. A, a simple way of doing a risk assessment is also very, very important, right? So those of you need more information, you can either reach uh, Azam or you can reach out to me. I have my details in the presentation at the end. So we'd be more than happy to you know, share some of our experience learnings with you. But in closing, what I want to tell you is as far as the hackers are concerned, all what is available with you is out for sale in the underground, right? The cyber ecosystem works, everything is for sale. What may appear to you trivial might be very important for somebody else. What may be important to your CEO in your organization may not be important to you. 
but it is important to the organization. So identify all sensitive information and ensure that you, you know, save them in a very safe place, protect them. Be careful not to use pirated software, always use a good antivirus system, right? So with that, I just want to end the session. And if there are any questions, I would definitely love to take them. Azam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit, uh, for an excellent uh, presentation and timed well, and uh, obviously very interesting. Um, the, so Sujit, uh, and also to th thank um, Dushan and Mano from uh, Stacks, uh, who took us through uh, a wide range of topics on digital strategy, implementation, and adoption, uh, spoke to us about clarity, customer capability, and competition as components of a framework to plan digital adoption. And what are the avenues available for SMEs for digital adoption for transformation? And uh, the importance of using a crisis period like now to embrace business model change, which with digital adoption, I think is, I mean, that's a critical point. I mean, we are, we are in a, an unprecedented time. And, and, and to look at, we spoke about uh, business model change in our previous webinars and how we can use that opportunity um, to really look at digital adoption. And uh, how do you operationalize the framework for digital adoption? So thank you, uh, Manu and uh, Tushan for that. And, and uh, from Sujit, we heard about the increased threat of cyber attacks and how the fact that people, where people are working, uh, where they're working, how they're working has changed. And how does that increase the nature uh, and, and the type of cyber attacks? And, and what are those cyber attacks? And uh, what are the most common ones and how can we protect businesses from variety of cyber attacks. Maybe since um, Sujit, you, you, you just spoke, maybe I, I'll pose the first question to you from uh, Yanendra Virakudi, who asks, uh, most of the company applications use AD authentication. So how about uh, security of those applications accessed from internet? I hope the question's clear for you. All right. Uh, am I audible? Okay, great. Yes. So, so if it is, uh, just a username and a password, that's not sufficient, right? So, so you may want to consider using multi-factor authentication for authenticating, not just the users, but also authenticating your devices as well. Because today we are getting into a situation where the devices which were within the organization were considered trusted. But the moment the device has left the organization out in the internet, you have to treat that as an untrusted device. So anyone accessing your corporate infrastructure had to go through that validation. Is this person's identity valid? Is he trusted? Is he accessing the information which he has already been authorized? So need to know, need to do, also will have to complement your access control policy. Right. I'm trying to keep it short in a sense of time so that others also can, you know, take questions. And if, let's say if they have more questions, want to know more details on this, please reach out to us. Yeah. And, and uh, one more question, uh, Sujit, before I turn to uh, Sean and Manu. Um, are we supposed to check routinely what are the mobile applications that are that had been delisted from App Store or Play Store? And uh, is, is there a preventive measure that we can take? Uh, you know, what is it? Now you, you showed a list. Uh, how can people be uh, uh, feel secure? Uh, the sim simplest thing to do is to you know Google every day. Like I said, as when you before you log into your Facebook or your Instagram or your Tinder accounts, Google what are the applications which has been removed by the app stores, Google Store or the i Store, and just see whether those are in your devices. If it is there, just immediately remove it. That's the easiest thing to do. And always ask yourself, right? I mean. Some of them are very enticing, but some of the games, for example, right? And uh, it can be considered uh, malicious because the attacker needs to only turn some features on later on to convert your device into a bot, right? So, so that's where the danger is. So, I mean, I would always advise people. I mean, some people, you know, tell me, you know, so you, you can't be carrying so many devices, but if you really see like, you know, I have so many devices, so you know, it's <laughs> difficult, right? So you've got to separate your personal and your business 
into two different segments or even within personal whatever is relating to you know sensitive information like banking and all those things then you need to use a clean device but today the world is congregating into one one device but then you need to use your judgment to stay safe thank you thank you sujit um if i can turn to dushan uh, or manu um, a question from chamila viratunga um hi is there a step wise guide for digitization of the business applicable for smes scale like bcps so i think the question is is there a step by step guide uh, for digitization uh, purely looking at the smes dushan uh, yeah, i'll take that question yeah uh, actually uh, it's an interesting question um, because if you see that's one of the reasons that we uh, came up with the framework if you see framework an outset is like almost like eight steps that you want to do but i understand what he's asking is you know are there any step by step uh, you know guide for each of these framework i mean when we do this work yes we internally have set of uh, things that we do but as i explain now if you take customer uh, as i said you know you do your uh, analysis of your past performance right you know you take take stock of what things that you have done and also your strategic ambitions and value proposition so i think the three steps in that is you know looking at you know taking stock of things that happen and also uh, understanding your strategic ambition is it relevant it should be change it and the third step is you know we really understand the customer value proposition so to understand the customer value proposition also you need to do a lot of research so i think it's hard to answer saying you know there are like you know i'm sure there'll be like 100 dot activities but we do follow when it's come to uh, using this framework or uh, using this framework with other clients i mean if you, we can support i mean if someone wants the exact details of all eight c's that we propose yes we have done there been there so we have lots of details please uh it's all about project management right it's just like you know having having uh, activities in place and then uh, following them so i mean they can reach out to us or maybe us to us um you know you can share our details you know we are happy to help i mean we can definitely guide you to the process in detail thank you thank you dushan just uh, maybe one one more question before we conclude uh, either manu or dushan could take this i mean when you when you talk about digitization for the layman uh, for smes you know we're looking at different enterprise solutions you know different softwares you know lots of people coming in trying to sell you erps and Uh, softwares and you know uh, how suji spoke about you need to make sure it's not pirated in the first place you know so how how does you know is there is there a few um, cardinal points is there a few you know uh, one two three you know the guidelines that you could give for businesses to keep in mind when making that decision yes you know it has to be uh, up to your scale with as a business would you really need to look at whether you need it for the business model yes but you know you, you can can you share perhaps a few few uh, underlying guidance when you for smes when they choose uh, softwares to buy enterprise i mean it enterprise solutions right no no perhaps mana you take that right yes so uh, <clears throat> basically like you said definitely if if you look at the vendors that provide services you will find definitely multiple vendors going from you know one end to the other and also if you look at their features while most of them will have like 80% like you know common features of the different platforms you will see like you know some people uh, saying like you know giving you a lower price point whereas some would give a higher price point based on like you know the different other features that they would do or their service so as an sme we are also crunched and also we we, ha- we have to look at uh, investments ahead of time again and also make sure that like you know we make the maximum use of the investment that we do we don't have a lot of resources available to uh, do a lot of testing so our advice is again think before you go ahead first evaluate the options now based on the framework if you remember the slides that we presented based on the framework try to understand whether you actually need it and also depending on your business which the business strategy and where you are in the business sometimes if you, if you are at the, at the at the very early stages of the business and you, you can basically uh take, do your operations with uh, without like a high end software please to go ahead and do with that because definitely there are uh, other I, i know for example there are smes that still work with excel based uh, applications and also who have 
done that improved stage. Remember the slide that I that I spoke to you about the options, the improved stage. So basically, what they have done is they have used the Excel sheets, then went on to a database operation, connected the databases to the Excel, and then had the people use the Excel as normal things. So the, there are forms and everything that you would see in a very high-end uh, ERP system that that will come in the Excel itself. It connects to a centralized database and it's managed properly. So. It's not always that you need to go for a high-end solution. You need to first evaluate, see whether it's your business need, where is the business going, and also whether the technology is disruptive or not. And then make your decision. There are definitely a lot of other options that you should go for or look at before going for a full-blown ERP implementation, for example. So uh, again, our advice is look at the options, see whether it makes sense, evaluate the cost, evaluate the effort, and then make the decision whether you should go for it or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mano. I won't take much of anybody's time on a, on a, on a Friday uh, evening. Uh, I'm sure everybody got a lot of things on the head. Just to sort of remind all participants that we have a very interesting um, webinar coming up next week on Thursday uh, with uh, PWC. Uh, who will be presenting on family businesses, uh, the special focus on SMEs. And we will also have uh, PwC's global leader, uh, thought leader on family business speaking, connecting from Germany for that webinar, uh, which is on Thursday, the 16th. Uh, if you have been a participant of any of our webinars, you will probably get that information on your inbox, but uh, try to remember it's going to be on Thursday afternoon uh, on family businesses. As many SMEs are family businesses, if you look at uh, family businesses have unique challenges to face. And, and the week after, on Friday, we have International Trade Center, who uh, had a couple of webinars about a month ago with us, will be presenting on uh, market analysis for trade in services. So we had one on trade in goods right at the beginning. So one on trade in services, especially, I think, useful for IT uh, industry. So uh, make a note of that. That's going to be on the 24th of July, which is a Friday. And, and on the 30th, we have one with uh, uh, Commercial Bank who will be talking about the financial literacy, uh, enhancing financial literacy for SMEs and what are the financing options available for SMEs uh, at this current time. So once again, thank you to our knowledge partners today, Stax uh, with uh, Dushan Kahandagamagi and Manos Senaratna presenting on digital uh, adaption today and Sujit uh, Christie from Centura Consultancy, Somalia Centura Consultancy. Uh, today presenting on cybersecurity. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it was a very useful session. And uh, an another reminder for everyone that the webinars are recorded and are available on the UN Sri Lanka YouTube page as well as the Facebook page. Uh, so please do have a look and share this with uh, your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much and have a good evening and have a good uh, good Sam? weekend. Sorry, Azam. I think there's one more question. Should we uh, take it on or? No, we'll uh, we'll try to link them up directly. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Dushan. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you.